Now, I would be remiss in not thanking Andy for his help with all of that work. He's taken a lot of the agronomic responsibilities off my plate so that I can really focus on disease, which is, which is my training. Um, and so one of the most significant diseases we've been seeing this year um, and in recent years in dark tobacco is angular leaf spot. There's a couple leaves going along down the rows. Um, I pulled those out of our research trial here, um, just a couple rows that way. Um, I pulled those leaves because basically diseases don't read the book, they don't happen in a vacuum. And so those leaves have two different diseases on them. Um, angular leaf spot, which is the reddish brown lesions. Um, at this point, they're fairly small, but they will get much larger. Um, there's also frog eye leaf spot on those leaves. So to differentiate between the two, frog eye leaf spots grow to roughly the size of a pencil eraser. Um, they have white to tan centers in the middle of those spots. Um, under really humid pea soup conditions like this, you'll see black sporulation in the center of those tan to white spots. That's frog eye. Angular leaf spot won't have whited out centers. The spots will get much bigger. Um, sometimes they're delimited by the veins, so that means it's, it's kind of like a stained glass window. And true to its name, it's angular in appearance. And so I make that distinction because it's important to know whether you're dealing with angular leaf spot or frog eye because it affects what you spray. Um, the, common, the common chemicals that we use to manage frog eye are fungicides and they're targeted toward managing fungal pathogens. Angular leaf spot is caused by a bacterial pathogen. And there are such um, fundamental differences between fungal pathogens and bacterial pathogens that what we're spraying for frog eye does nothing, does nothing to manage the angular leaf spot. Um, so what are some conditions, some environmental conditions that we know are connected with angular leaf spot epidemics? Excessive nitrogen fertility. We know that plants become more susceptible to disease. They're, they're more easily infected when the nitrogen fertility is above and beyond what they really need. Um, and so for growers, you know, we recommend a more moderate, a more moderate nitrogen fertility. In our disease trial, behind me, um, we've, we've just pumped that field full of nitrogen so that we get excellent disease, so that we have a very good chemical test. Um, another one is rainy or severe weather. Um, bacterial pathogens are kind of weaklings um, it, when you're comparing different microbes. Fungal pathogens have the ability to kind of punch through the plant tissue to actively infect the plant. Bacterial pathogen, pathogens need a wound or a natural opening, otherwise you won't have infection. Um, and so when we have severe weather events, when we have driving rain, um, when we have high winds, when we have the wind sort of picking up soil and kind of sandblasting leaves, all of those instances, um, are there's potential for bacteria to be introduced into the plants with all of those in instances, and then disease can kind of take off from there. And then the last one, successive tobacco crops in a field. Um, and so for multiple reasons, we recommend rotating fields, um, and that includes to reduce angular leaf spot pressure. We know that the angular leaf spot pathogen, we can get it out of soils. Um, it, can overwinter, it can overwinter in association with crop debris as well. And so if you're following tobacco crop after tobacco crop, there's a higher potential for you to be starting, starting plants in a field that already has the angular leaf spot bacteria in it. Now I know they're not making more land and I know crop rotation can always be a challenge. And so in one of the other groups I got the question, well how many years out do you need to be? I can't tell you specifically how many years, but what I can tell you is the more years out, the better. Um, you know, I think, I think for, other, for other diseases, we're recommending three years out. If you can do that, great. Two years is better than one. One year is better than two. 
So before I talk about our chemical test, I wanted to talk about chemicals that would not be expected to be effective for angular leaf spot management. And this is because when we get calls, um, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the first questions we ask is what have you sprayed? Um, and so folks will tell me, you know, I've sprayed quadris because I saw the angular leaf spot out there. We would not expect quadris to have any activity for angular leaf spot. Um, Quadris is a very good compound for managing frog eye, which is the other disease that was on those leaves that went around. It's very good against target spot. Angular leaf spot, it won't, it won't do a thing for. Um, another common one that we've been hearing about this year are the phosphite type products. Very little has been done looking at those phosphites in tobacco. Um, so I went and, and found data in other crop systems. The phosphites are effective, but they're effective at managing all mycete-induced diseases. Um, so these are things like downy mildews or phytophthora root rots. For us in tobacco, we might expect some efficacy from phosphites if we had a blue mold issue. Or, if we, or there may be some efficacy with black shank. I haven't done the, that testing myself because this is a fairly recent, this is, phosphites are fairly new to, to the tobacco world. They've been used for a while in other crop systems. Um, but we wouldn't expect efficacy against bacterial disease, which is what ALS is. Um, and then our mainstays, Ritamil, Arondis Gold, and Presidio, those mainstays for black shank management, we wouldn't expect efficacy from those on angular leaf spot. Again, because those products, they're targeted toward the soil olmycete pathogens. They won't touch the angular leaf spot bacterial pathogen. So what will? Um, that's the subject of our research trial here on the farm. I'm working on this trial with Andy Bailey and we have, we have support from Altria and also Valent, which is one of the chemical companies. Um, we've got 12 treatments in this trial. We're looking at a grower standard streptomycin application treatment schedule. Um, streptomycin is effective when the timing of that application can be made um, associated with severe weather events. Um, so I was actually, I was looking up last night and I found that the half-life of streptomycin is five to six hours. So you can expect half of, that, half of the efficacy of that chemical to be gone after five or six hours. So it's a very um, short acting, there's, there's, there's no uptake into the plant tissue, there's no kickback. It's not like quadrus that actually gets taken up into the leaves and has some lasting action. It's not like some of those black shank fungicides. Um, it's very much a surface, a surface treatment. Um, in this trial, we also have some plant defense inducing compounds, things that act kind of like a flu shot to the plants to increase their defenses. Um, we have some biological controls. Um, products that have living, living organisms in them that don't cause disease on the plants themselves, but kind of fight against the disease-causing agents. Um, we also have copper compounds involved here. Copper is a real mainstay for bacterial disease management in vegetable systems and my other systems. And there are some copper compounds that are labeled for tobacco. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you had a question, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then there's another compound. This is another biological control, but it works in a slightly different way. It's called phage. Um, what that is is bacteria that we're applying to the plants that are already infected with a virus. And when those bacterial cells die, they lice open, they, they kind of burst open and release more virus into the environment. And so this virus, it doesn't hurt us. It, it can't infect us, but what it can infect are the ALS bacteria. And so we're leaving no stone unturned here. We're looking at a lot of different options in this test. Um, I did inoculate this test, and so what that means is I introduced the ALS bacteria into the test um, to ensure that we get disease, because believe it or not, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't get disease in our tests. Um, so, 
to be sure that it's a pretty formidable challenge for these chemicals. That's why I've introduced the bacteria to our trial. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about, and I, and, um, so I talked about um, streptomycin is the major way we manage bacterial disease. It's an antibiotic. Um, and the question has come up from particular farmers, um, do I have resistance to streptomycin? It doesn't seem to be working when I apply it to my, to my crop. Um, and so in 2016 and 2017, we've been testing for resistance to streptomycin just based on the samples that we're receiving in the disease lab here at Princeton. And Brenda Kennedy is the one doing, doing the hands-on, this, this testing for us. Um, and so in 2016, she tested 13 samples. One out of the 13 was found to be resistant. That single isolate, that single bacterial, um, that bacterial individual grew on 25 times the field rate of streptomycin. So it was very resistant. Um, what's potentially more impactful is that six out of the 13, just about half, um, grew on the 100 parts per million rate, the low rate of streptomycin on the label, but they were inhibited at 200, at 200 parts per million at the high rate. And so for growers, for growers, if you're choosing to spray streptomycin on your crops, if you're going to the time and the expense of making that application, use the high rate, use the 200 parts per million rate because that gives you the best chance for that chemical to work on your bacterial populations. In 2017, we're continuing this testing and it's happening, it's, a, it's happening right across the street right now. Um, and actually, I should update this number. Um, we've tested 18 samples so far, and we have two. We have two that we've identified that are insensitive to streptomycin, that streptomycin does not seem to be working. And so of these three samples, um, these came from different farms, unassociated farms, farms with a history of tobacco production, that's for sure, but they're in different counties, they're not sharing equipment. And so what that means is, what that means is we would expect resistance to be developing in a fairly um, concentrated area and it will be specific farm by farm. And so it's really going to take testing. It's really going to take testing to know whether a particular farm has a resistance problem or not. Um, so with that, that's all I have.